I'm Andrew Hollenbach, Associate Professor of the Department of Genetics at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm joined today by Dr. Kristen Ekstrin, MD candidate at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and co-director of the Vanderbilt Program for LGBTI Health, Dr. Kerry Roth-Bayer, Associate Professor in the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine and Medical Education at Morehouse School of Medicine, and Associate Director of Educational Leadership for the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, and Dr. Siddharth Puri, Psychiatry Resident at the University of California, Los Angeles, Samuel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Thank you all for being able to join us today. Kristen, what historical barriers have made it challenging to include content on LGBT and DSD affected individuals in undergraduate medical curricula? There have actually been a, a variety of barriers a, across the decades. Um, for a long time, of course, LGBT identity uh, certainly wasn't understood as an entity in and of itself, but even starting back in sort of the 1960s, 1970s, um, as LGBT, the different identities thereof, uh, start to become better understood uh, as sort of uh, identities of sexual orientation and then gender identity and expression. Uh, as those things became more socially uh, visible, that was when things started to become more engaged in medical education. And certainly, homosexuality was part of the DSM uh, until 1973 when it was removed. Uh, but gender identity disorder actually stayed in the DSM until uh, 2013, I believe. 13? 2013. Uh, and when it became rewritten as gender dysphoria. So certainly even just the criminalization or uh, the pathology of this type of behavior and expression has been a barrier. But even within medical school itself, there have been numerous barriers that have actually been evidence-based. So one, uh, faculty have had a difficult time both with comfort in discussing this information, understanding this information, certainly as we've all gained a better understanding over the past several decades uh, about what sexual orientation is and what gender identity uh, and expression are. Uh, faculty comfort with teaching, understanding of it, having an evidence base for teaching it, having a strategy for teaching it, uh, and then student receptiveness and uh, sort of engagement with this activity too uh, has also been challenging. I think the only other thing I would add there is just time in a curriculum, there's always kind of competing to get more content and depending upon what topic is um, most current, most relevant, most needed is how we find that time to work into a curriculum has also sometimes been a, a historical barrier to getting new content in and, and an institution's climate or receptiveness. I would also argue that uh, certainly the relevance of this content isn't often seen across medical specialties. So uh, LGBT care uh, and certainly care of uh, individuals who have differences of sex development um, often tends to get uh, categorized into a variety of medical specialties, specifically endocrinology or infectious disease. And a lot of people don't really understand uh, the depth to which uh, LGBT and DSD-affected health um, are, are pervasive sort of across curricula, so even understanding of where the content fits is a barrier. Carrie, what strategies have worked for effectively including this content into undergraduate medical curricula? So I think some of the strategies that have worked have been finding ways to incorporate in content that exists. So whether it's adding identities, expressions, examples into case-based learning, um, whether it's adding into that standardized uh, patient interaction or that OSCE lab, um, whether it's including you know, a, a case or a didactic lecture, I think the, the strategies that have really been effective is not creating a new curriculum, a new elective, but really looking at low-hanging fruit easy wins um, that can be incorporated without needing a whole new body of faculty to who are experts or content experts in each area. Um, those have been some of the most effective strategies. And also an, an infusion across a program versus a one elective that might only reach a handful of students. 
I, I would also add that a, a lot of stuff uh, that gets into the curriculum, a lot of information um, has been student-led as well. So another effective strategy uh, for groups that are just students or have a faculty advisor uh, can be doing lunch and learn sessions. Again, what Carrie is talking about is integrating content across the curriculum that is absorbed uh, and learned by all students. But of course, there are always going to be some students and some faculty who really uh, are invested in this content and want to learn um, more. And so doing those journal clubs, lunch and learn sessions can bring uh, sort of the unique aspects of LGBT and, and DSD affected health to people uh, to really that really enjoy learning a lot about that information and can really cultivate a better understanding beyond just the basics. So the flip side, Sid, of that is what strategies have been tried but have not necessarily worked as well in incorporating this information into the curriculum? Yeah, I think the one that kind of jumps out to my mind is the fact that some schools don't even try, and that's a really ineffective way to actually get anything across. I think um, some schools specifically don't, don't include um, sexual orientation, gender identity, and LGBT issues within the curriculum, whether it be in kind of like with OSCEs or patient interactions, um, standardized patients. I think what I've seen that hasn't been as effective, and it's something that we actually tried to do at UC Davis, was have a longitudinal course. And what we tried to do was have seven different lectures kind of around LGBT issues. And what I found was the, the same 20 people were coming, but we weren't actually reaching the, the kind of like the broader, the, the other members of the medical community within the school. So we weren't reaching a lot of the residents, a lot of the faculty who are like tangentially interested, but were too busy with like science-based learning and teaching med, med students in that way. And so it was kind of difficult to kind of navigate that and try to incorporate it. And we found that we weren't getting as much of a, a change in the aspects that we were hoping for. I think one other thing that, that Sid brings up too is that, that question of sustainability, is that if you have something that is uh, an, something outside of the curriculum, whether it's an elective course or just these lunch sessions uh, that are not integrated across and built into the curriculum, there's no sustainability of those. So to have uh, the individuals who oversee medical education and undergraduate medical curricula, if you have those individuals overseeing this content, you make sure that it, it stays in the curriculum. So I guess a, a tangential question that comes out of that is, would you see that by starting like these lunchtime lessons or these lunchtime journal clubs, that that could eventually gain the interest which would start the ball rolling towards more of an implementation within the curriculum to uh, provide that sustainability? Def definitely. What we saw actually through these lectures, we a lot of our faculty were like, you know, if you're, when you're talking about hormone therapy, I can actually include that in the endocrinology course if you think that would be something that would be helpful for the rest of the students who weren't able to come to your, to your lectures. And so with that way, kind of like what Kristen was saying, the sustainability happens naturally. And it's this organic process that if you make enough noise and you try something and it's not working and people are like, Let's figure out a way to make it work. It's kind of like exposing them to. I think it's that combination of the informal learning and the formal learning. And without an institutional climate that's ready, you can add content in, but it, if it's not followed through or if different messages are sent or there's a hidden curriculum that's going on, then it's really not effective at sustaining the efforts. Um, I know we've seen through things like not only the journal clubs and the speakers and the student clubs, um, but also our equity and diversity um, committees and you know what are our policies stay in um, discrimination policies or our equal opportunity employment policies and what do our partner benefits look like? And so all of these other pieces that you know more informally actually affect that formal curriculum and, and those long-term efforts. And I think, I think Carrie raises an excellent point, is that if you see medical education as part of this larger system, the question that institutions have to ask themselves is, what is my impetus to change? How do I establish that need to change? So individuals who really want to propel this work forward, understanding your climate uh, is first and foremost very important. So what is your need to change? At Vanderbilt, you know, our need was, we found that there were uh, deficits in student, students' knowledge and skills and attitudes related to working with patients who identify as LGBT, uh, which 
really makes us think twice about the type of education that we're providing. So once you, and in other, other contexts, it's, it's climate, it's sexual orientation. Our students uh, who identify as LGBT, their needs aren't met. Well, how do we meet their needs? And then you learn about needs in that process. So understanding what really drives your institution to change and what that change is, is incredibly valuable. So of all these different strategies that you've mentioned, which are the easiest and which are more difficult and may take more time and more patience by those who are trying to implement this change? I think it depends on who your team is. To, to be honest, you know, if you're a student, uh, absolutely knowing which faculty members are supportive of you uh, and knowing what that faculty member might have uh, influence to change. Uh, if that faculty member is uh, the dean of medical education, which is was the case at Vanderbilt, we had an opportunity to create uh, change across the curriculum. If that faculty member uh, is a professor of a certain course, you have influence over that certain course. The first thing to do is identify your allies and then figure out what it is that they have influence over. But regardless of that, you have to have patience. Uh, understanding that the first time that you do something might be a mistake. Understanding that the first time uh, you get it right, you may not have assessed it. Understanding that your assessment method may be flawed uh, or you know, that you didn't ask the right questions. So there's always a next step, but being proud of what you've done I think is incredibly important. I think it's also the the raising the visibility, you know, as a faculty member, it's sitting in committees and bringing the issues up and bringing them to the forefront. Um, whether you're talking about cultural competence, whether you're talking about cultural humility, whether you're talking about diversity, and what does that mean? Um, you know, a, a good example is I'm on the equity and diversity committee, and we're working on a climate survey, and I couldn't be there for one meeting, but I had brought up sexual orientation and gender identity enough in those meetings that in my absence, I other, had other colleagues who were stepping up to say, you know what, we need to make sure that content is in there. So it's finding those ways that it's not, champions are really important, but the message has to continue beyond the champions in order for it to sustain. I think everyone who wants to do this type of work needs to convey the message to all of their team members, whether it's faculty or students or administration. You, know, you should be asking, yourself two questions. What am I doing to promote LGBT and DSD affected health and what could I be doing to promote LGBT and DSD affected health? So if you get people thinking in that in that mindset, the brainstorming and the opportunities really, really come out. So along these same lines, what steps can be taken? So once you've assessed the climate and you know what barriers exist at your particular institution, what are steps that you can take to develop a plan to successfully incorporate LGBT and DSD affected issues into undergraduate medical school curricula? I think one of the first things that we can, you can, we can look to now are uh, the, the competencies that the uh, AAMC LGBT and DSD affected patient care advisory committee have put out. Uh, these have been put out uh, with the intent of being mindful of the direction of where medical education is going, which is based on a standardized set of competencies. Uh, the monograph that the AAMC committee uh, is, has published as well uh, will also uh, highlight all of the information about how you can integrate this information and how you can assess it and different methods for assessing it uh, within the context of, of where medical education is going and provides really fantastic examples of how this information doesn't have to be something that needs to be separate from the curriculum but how you can take LGBT issues and integrate them with other issues such as uh, psychiatry or renal disease uh, and have a patient uh, who is gay uh, but is coming in for a different medical concern, how do you do a sensitive exam? Things like that where you really just can take uh, one small piece and just include LGBT but it, it changes the entire meaning of the case and encourages students to think differently. I think to echo that it's also um, finding your allies within the school. So knowing kind of where you can start change and know, trying to figure out what's been tried at your school before. I know at Davis we had 
tried similar um, lecture series before and they'd kind of failed. And so we tried to like change them in order to have them succeed and they, and they failed in different ways. And then knowing to kind of like go to the next step of like the Dean of Education and figuring out kind of how we can incorporate these competencies more into like the kind of daily curriculum that we have, even within our doctrine curriculum, which is like, as you said, one of the best ways to do it in terms of like having a gay patient whose disease can be divorced from his sexuality and should be in the way that we kind of start seeing patients holistically. I think too, another place to start is curriculum mapping. So, you know, most understanding where that curriculum committee is or who controls, influences that curriculum and, and finding out what's being done and where it's being done and it might not be called exactly what you're calling it. Um, so making sure you query that in a number of ways and, and then finding out, you know, hey, we've got these new cases. Do you think maybe you could include this case or exactly what you were saying that, you know, can this renal patient or can this OBGYN patient who's coming in, can you still have a conversation about family creation, but not necessarily contraception? Um, and, you know, s small examples, short, easy examples to implement um, that don't take implementing a whole new curriculum. And even if you're, you're not involved directly in the cur curriculum, there, there are ways that you can uh, really influence the direction of the curriculum. So, for example, if you're on the admissions committee, making sure that you are bringing in students who uh, voice uh, interest in, in these types of issues. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be LGBT or uh, have a, a difference of sex development at all. It can just be someone who has that interest. So asking the right questions uh, of students and then also of, of faculty, making sure that you are bringing people on board who have the ability to, to bring this forward and really uh, you know, bringing your champions on your team. Now, Kristen, you mentioned the um, monograph that the AAMC committee is putting out. But other than the monograph, what other resources are available that could help individuals who are interested develop a plan to implement these issues into medical school education? Yeah, there, there are actually a variety of resources out there. Um, the first one I would also point people to is through the AAMC using MedEd Portal. Uh, MedEd Portal now has a, a a specific section for um, LGBT and, and DSD affected materials. This can be in the context of publications uh, that have been peer reviewed or in the context of iCollaborative, which could be posters or PowerPoint presentations that people have used and submitted, uh, or even in the CE directory for continuing education if you want uh, to look at faculty development. So that's certainly a great resource. Some other resources um, that are available, there are some phenomenal publications out there. So the Institute of Medicine's uh, 2011 report uh, is really uh, provides a lot of information about what we know and where we need to go with our knowledge uh, that can provide a foundation for content. Um, the uh, Fenway Institute's LGBT Health Education Center has webinars uh, available, archived and uh, online. Um, these can be uh, used by faculty for continuing medical education credit as well. Um, certainly there have been other publications like the Fenway Guide uh, that have come out that also provide content. Uh, and then there are some different sort of learning series. The AAMC Diversity 3.0 Learning Series has a little bit of information uh, on LGBT health. And uh, GLAMA LGBT, uh, the, sorry, <coughs> GLAMA Health Professionals Advancing LGBT Equality uh, runs a listserv uh, of students who are LGBT identified or working on LGBT curriculum and their annual conference highlights this information each year. Uh, and I would also point to the American Medical Student Association that also is, is active in gender and sexuality issues. I think what I would add to that is just looking in your own backyard and who are those agencies, partners that you have in your local area um, that it's great that we can access so much stuff online, but you know, calling your local advocacy organization and having them come be um, on a panel or you know, we, in Atlanta we have the Health Initiative and Georgia Equality and representatives from SAGE and so they've become really good partners to put a face and then also be those partners when we're actually moving out into the community to you know, see that applied, um, applied learning. I'd echo that. That worked really well with us in Sacramento and Los Angeles, kind of the interplay between academia and community medicine and kind of interlinking them and weaving them to bring in patients to discuss their kind of positive and negative experiences with healthcare professionals for med students and residents so we can like 
model our behavior and know how to ask questions that are difficult at times. So, so any last thoughts, Sid? I think it's really important. I think what I've learned from kind of trying to incorporate LGBT healthcare into medicine is to, to take a step back and to remember that in a lot of the ways that LGBT care is taught, we a lot of people tend to categorize and we like to like put people in little boxes in medicine in general. And to take a step back from that and realize that being whatever their sexuality, gender orientation is, that's an aspect of them that can impact their mental health but or their, their physical health as well, but it isn't the only aspect of them until they kind of holistically look at patients. Carrie? I would say not to forget those um, collaborative inter interdisciplinary efforts and using a multi-pronged multi approach and even little things can make a difference even if you start with a journal club or a student organization but even building on things like accreditations. Um, accreditations are good processes to take that step back and look at what am I really doing around diversity and inclusion and, and this is really a natural fit so finding the, the small ways, the big ways, but going at it from a multi-pronged approach. Kristen? I think it, one of the most exciting things from our experience in general is, is just being able to, uh, when you have a topic that is not integrated well into the curriculum or needs uh, more enhancement in terms of assessment, um, and you have a small team, uh, it's really a great opportunity uh, to learn how to teach something well. Um, because if you teach it well, you get people excited, you get students excited. Uh, and that's been one of the, the most exciting parts that, that, that I've gotten to experience, um, is that if you do a good job of talking about it and teaching about it and making it relevant to patient health, uh, people will come out and say, uh, I'm excited and I want to do this too. Uh, and you can really bring uh, team members on board that way and en enhance what, whatever it is that you're working on. Okay. Thank you all for being with us today.